Dr. Michael Baden, a former New York City medical examiner who observed Epstein's autopsy at the hands of Epstein's brother Mark, says that he believes the findings of the autopsy are more consistent with strangulation than with suicidal hanging. Then, the Washington Post runs an article calling for laws barring hate speech to be introduced into the United States, effectively abolishing freedom of speech as we know it. We find out that a majority of American students want offensive Halloween costumes to be banned. And finally, Vice News wants to normalize having sex with bugs. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's Halloween. We've got some very scary stories for you, so do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. Got a lot of very interesting stories to go over today. And the fun part about celebrating Halloween within the political realm, because, you know, I, I try to make it fun, like, oh, hey, we're going to talk about scary stories on Halloween, but instead of fictitious stories, they're news stories. But, of course, that means there is no escape. There is no waking up from this bad dream. We can only fight back. But uh, before we get into that, I do have to apologize for the gap in content that we've had recently. Uh, we're going to get back into the rhythm of things now. But part of that was due to Politicon, which was last weekend, so I drove down to Nashville for that. Uh, the convention itself was pretty underwhelming, but I will tell you this. I'm in no sense an optimist, but that being said, my energy levels are high, right? Like, I'm never going to stop, but I also won't lie to myself about the reality of the situation. But after this weekend, through the people I met, the conversations I had, the energy I saw, everything that I saw, really, let me tell you firsthand that it is looking very good for us. There is reason to wake up. Not all is lost. There are very good people doing very good things in a wide range of capacities, everything from working behind the scenes to make things happen to just simply attending an event in support of the conservative cause. Everyone seems to be doing their part. Everyone is passionate. Everyone is invested. The energy is high. I haven't felt this good about the movement since 2016. And for those of you who were there in 2016, you know that that's really saying something. So we're feeling good coming back from Politicon. Like, as a movement... Because uh, I actually, I got a migraine at Politicon, which took me out for a day. For those of you who get migraines, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I was attending a conversation between Ann Coulter and David Frum, and I started to just kind of feel it coming on. And when you get migraines, like, it hurts so bad that when it first starts to set in, you just go through this period where you're trying to convince yourself that it's anything except that. And so that's what I was doing. So after the event was over, me and cameraman Badan started to leave. And I guess this young lady saw us walking out and she tried to flag us down. I didn't notice it at the time, but she caught up and she was like, John Doyle, John Doyle, hi. And I was just kind of like, hi, because, you know, my head was imploding on itself like a collapsing star. So if that young lady is watching, I have to apologize for having below normal energy levels at that particular moment. I'm glad that we had a second to chat. I hope you had a great time at the convention. And same goes to every other fan of the show that was there that we took pictures with. That was a lot of fun. And again, the energy is looking good for 2020. Last thing, remember today is the last day to sign up for a membership at heckoffkami.com to be automatically entered into a free merchandise giveaway. If you win, I'm literally just gonna ask you like, what do you want? And I'll just send it to you because I want as much anti-communist rhetoric as possible in the public domain. So now let's talk about Jeffrey Epstein. A lot of you will remember that when Epstein was killed by himself, Obviously, <laughs> he was. remember that when Epstein was killed by himself, I had a poster of him made to hang next to my bed so that I would never forget about what had happened because the media wanted and expected all of us to just move on, and that's exactly what everyone did. I mean, seriously, like, when's the last time you've thought about Jeffrey Epstein, about what happened to or what happened with Jeffrey Epstein? Most people have just completely forgotten about it, as was expected, but we all basically knew that was going to happen. But anyways, I'll play you the clip so you can see what I'm talking about. Well, I was asked by the brother, the next of kin, to be at the autopsy mm -hmm. and at the autopsy on day one there were findings that were unusual for suicidal hanging and more consistent with uh, ligature homicidal strangulation which and, included and it was suggested at the time that he committed suicide by doing what by by hanging uh, at the time he was found allegedly hanging by uh, a uh, homemade ligature of sheets are you saying you don't think it was suicide I think that the evidence points toward homicide rather than suicide. Why? Because there are multiple three fractures in the hyoid bone, the thyroid cartilage, that are very unusual for suicide and more uh, uh, indicative of strangulation, homicidal strangulation. So Dr. Baden just provided to us a thorough summary of the events that transpired with Jeffrey Epstein. And just for clarification, in case anyone new happens to be watching, any former first ladies happen to be watching, I've always maintained that the Epstein suicide is totally legitimate. I believe that he was taken off suicide watch, that both cameras malfunction, all these coincidences perfectly aligning. I believe all of it. 
because I believe everything that the government tells me. And if this guy's coming out, stirring up trouble, saying, well, you know, the type of fractures that we witnessed in Epstein's case are more commonly found in homicide cases rather than suicide cases, particularly in homicidal strangulation. That doesn't matter to me because it's just a crazy conspiracy theory. Who cares if this guy's examined over 20,000 bodies in his career? Who cares if this guy says that in 50 years he's never seen a suicide case in which these fractures occurred? Not me. That's who doesn't care. I don't care. I think this is all totally normal, and I don't know anything else about the case, just so we're clear. But anyways, moving on. Uh, So the Washington Post, they ran this op-ed a few days ago entitled Why America Needs a Hate Speech Law, and it was written by this guy named Richard Stengel who worked at the State Department under the Obama administration. And so he starts off by saying that he loves the way that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. asserted that the First Amendment is not just about protecting free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. So it's off to a good start. But then he continues by writing that as he worked for the government and he traveled around the world, he realized that our First Amendment is an outlier within the context of global discourse, which is you know, sort of the whole point. Um, but then he writes that, yes, the First Amendment protects the thought that we hate, but it should not protect hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another. In an age when everyone has a megaphone, that seems like a design flaw. So it's important to note that the implication from this statement is already legally actualized, which is that he's saying we shouldn't protect hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another. So here's the correct interpretation of that. Hateful speech that can cause violence would mean speech that is hateful in that it has immoral purposes and its potential to cause violence is rooted in that it is a direct call to violence and it's being used by one group, which would be the aggressors versus another group, which would be the victims. That is already not allowed. That is categorically not protected speech. We can all agree on that. But the problem with the way this guy worded this is that you and I both know what he's talking about and you and I both know that he knows what he's talking about and all three of us know that the average person reading this who doesn't know the laws in this country will be inclined to think, well, yeah, you know, that's true. Let's listen to whatever this guy says. But just for the sake of clarity, we'll translate this from his Marxist dialect. So he writes that hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another should not be allowed. But what he means is literally any hateful speech, any negative speech that could cause violence, which actually encompasses all negative speech in effect. Because if you're going to start predicting which negative speech will cause violence and which negative speech will not cause violence, you're going to have to err on the side of caution and just assume that all of it's going to cause violence, which works out well because you're a Marxist who wanted to restrict freedom of speech in the first place. But um, also with the last part, violence by one group against another. He's not talking about literal teams or literal groups. He's not talking about like red versus blue. He's specifically referring to intersectional groups. He's referring to men versus women, whites versus blacks, Christians versus Muslims. That's what he's talking about. He doesn't care if I'm from Detroit and you're from Chicago and I insult you. That's not the type of group to which he's referring. He's exclusively referring to groups as defined by leftism, groups decided by race, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, etc. And that's the type of speech that should not be allowed. And because it is allowed, it's proof of a design flaw within our Bill of Rights, which he actually continues to lambast by writing that it's important to remember that our First Amendment doesn't just protect the good guys. Our foremost liberty also protects any bad actors who hide behind it to weaken our society. That is totally irrelevant. He's saying that, well, because those who act in bad faith share equal access to liberties, it endangers society, and because of that, we should restrict all liberty. It's like the Benjamin Franklin quote, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And the best part is, it's not even that dangerous. Oh, well, you would never understand because you're a white man. Actually, the reason I understand is because I am a white man and because I'm an outspoken conservative, I've been on the receiving end of more racist, sexist, threatening rhetoric than you can even imagine, even before I decided to put my face out there. But I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I'm not a victim. So I move on. And hey, if you're really so afraid that people are going to be inspired by someone saying that your particular intersectional group is dumb or something that, you know, they're going to come and hurt you, just go buy a gun. Problem solved. And that's the thing. Because we let them start to chip away at our Second Amendment rights decades ago, now look where we are. We got permits, tax stamps, three-day waiting, magazine limits, et cetera, et cetera, infringement, infringement. So just imagine where we'll be if we allow them to start chipping away at our First Amendment. It's always the same justification throughout history. I mean, this guy says, well, people who enjoy liberty use that liberty to harm society. Same thing under Nazism, socialism. Well, well, then it's, you know, you can't criticize the leader because it harms the society. So I guess we're going to kill you now. Yeah, not personally a fan, uh, but we move on. So this is sort of related. We've got data from the College Pulse that shows that 55% of American students believe that offensive Halloween costumes should be banned and anyone who wears one should be punished. And not that it matters or anything, but the data also shows a general trend of the farther left you are, the more in support of banning these costumes you are, and the farther right you are, the more in support of these costumes as protected speech you are. And again, 
Not that it matters, but women were more likely to support the ban than men, and non-binary people were the most likely to support it. Why would women want offensive costumes banned? I don't know. Probably the same reason they want everything else, which is that they don't know, but if you don't know, it's because you weren't listening. Right. Uh, but this is what we're going to have to expect. We've got 51% of millennials who want fines or jail time for hate speech, 60% of millennials who want the First Amendment rewritten because it's outdated. And to their credit, only 47% of baby boomers agree, but that's just because they want to be able to keep sh on Zoomers and millennials without getting institutionalized for it. Uh, but the biggest problem with this whole idea is that it's trying to have the law, which ought to exist objectively, reflect something that only exists subjectively. There is no objective measure of what is offensive and what is not offensive. You've got people who are offended by a lot. You've got people who are offended by very little. And any law that attempts to reflect that would be arbitrarily drawn. And sure, it starts on things that most of us can agree are bad. Things like blackface. I personally find blackface offensive because of its history and disparaging black Americans. But some people don't, some black people don't even find it offensive. And so I'm not going to sit here and pretend that my moral framework is superior. And therefore, I get to decide what type of content everyone is allowed to subject themselves to. Do you notice that? With all, it's always, with all these costumes, with blackface, it's always white liberals getting offended on behalf of blacks, Native Americans, whichever group. It's seldom a grievance from the group supposedly being victimized. It's always some liberal white woman talking about, my heart is breaking for the Native Americans who had to walk across campus and see Chad wearing the headdress of their ancestors. It's like no one actually cares. The most offensive Halloween co actually, I do know what it was. I know exactly what it was, but it was epic. It was playfully racist, but it was epic. And now I have to tell you, though, because otherwise people are going to extrapolate. So back in high school, I dressed up as a marshmallow. My costume was literally a garbage can wrapped in this white fabric that I bought. It kind of looked like cotton. Um, and the girl dressed up as a Hershey bar, but her costume was like cute or whatever. You know, she, she's a girl. So she made herself a nice little brown dress with the Hershey lettering on it. Because that's the difference. Because girls on Halloween, they want to be like cute. It's like, oh, look at my dress. Oh, look at my hair. And dudes just want to be like, bro, like I walk around like it's like, you know, so I was just occupying the superfluous amount of space just walking around all day in this garbage can. Uh, but then we both had cardboard that we had drawn on. So it looked like graham crackers. And so together we went as a s'more. Now. The reason it's funny is because this girl happened to be black and I happened to be white. So she played the role of a Hershey bar and I played the role of a marshmallow. Now, I don't care who you are, that's funny. And everyone thought it was funny, students, teachers, everyone, especially my friends, but mainly because they said that my costume looked like a tampon. But that's what I'm talking about. It's like some liberal white girl was gonna go up to her and be like, oh my God, your costume is probably offending so many other black people right now. You should take that off. It's like, no, shut up. It's funny. It's lighthearted. It's in good fun. It was epic. And that's the thing. We can't allow for something that does not exist objectively to be reflected in our laws because we might say, hey, we're banning offensive costumes, you know, stuff like blackface. Oh, okay. Hey, wait a minute, uh, why are you dressed like that? Oh, well, what do you mean? You said that we were only banning blackface. No, 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 I said anything that's offensive. That could include blackface, and that's true. It could include blackface, and it could include anything. So in order to protect our right to self-expression, our right to free speech, we have to include all of it. We have to take that risk. I disapprove of your use of blackface, but I will defend to the death your right to do it. Oh man, okay, moving on, last one. We've got Vice News covering something called uh, formicophilia, which is when you have sex with bugs, I guess? It's like when you have sex with bugs, but also when you have sex like with bugs, like bugs are present. So I guess they're also assisting in some way. I don't know, I'm old fashioned. I don't really see the utility in literally sticking worms up your pee pee. And that's the thing about this video. They're trying to normalize it. They're trying to normalize these degenerate fetishes by introducing them into the mainstream. And this is what happens when a culture has no self-control. This is what happens when a culture has no control over its impulses. And that's not to say that we're all just on the edge of our seats trying our best to resist the temptation to sexually assault a praying mantis. That's not what this is. It's just when a culture loses its sexual morality, when the importance of sexual relationships is undermined, people will start to explore darker things things such as this. A few generations ago, simply looking at your partner would be enough. You know, that relationship you two share, ideally committed, monogamous relationship, but you get the point. That used to get the job done. But now our culture has embraced hardcore pornography. You've got kids being exposed to it. I think the average age is 11. Everyone with internet access, which means everyone has unlimited access to it. And so what it does is it perverts normal human sexuality. And I'm being totally serious right now. The same reason we have furries, which for those of you who don't know, they're people that put on animal costumes and fornicate. It's the same reason we have people putting bugs in their urethras to get off. It's the 
the same reason, which is that our culture is becoming perverted. You expose yourself to certain levels of content, pretty soon that's not gonna be enough anymore. So you go down this rabbit hole until you find yourself needing to expose yourself to some pretty weird stuff just to get to the point that you would have been at before. It's the same with any addiction, any indulgence, whether it's alcohol, drugs, sugar, it all works the same. And we're gonna do a video on this later this month explaining this in more detail. But for now, hopefully we can all just point at the freaks and laugh. Hopefully we can all point at those opposed to free speech and laugh. Hopefully we can point at those who think like, Jeffrey Epstein uh, was killed. Yeah, you're crazy. Let's laugh at you. But we can all point and laugh today because it's Halloween. It's fun. But tomorrow, back to normal, back to business as usual. We actually have to go back to combating these people to take control of our culture and our country. So there's that. But hey, you know, happy Halloween. Um, hey guys, if you like this video, you should give it a thumbs up, you should share it with your friends, you should subscribe to the channel, and, uh, oh, what's that, leave it a comment, that's what you should do, and have a good, have a good Halloween, and thank you so much for watching, and may God bless America. Uh, did you meet Steven, or Steve, Steve, that's his name, Steve is our festive Halloween pumpkin candle holder, so he's done a lot of good stuff today, it's been a great help. So very much appreciate uh, Steve. So thank you so much for watching again, and may God bless America. There we go. Honk, honk.